This amazing story happened in the spring of 1943. The British conducted a unique operation called Chastise, in which the best pilots and one brilliant scientist participated, who managed to cause great problems to German military production and bring the defeat of Nazi Germany closer. Sit back comfortably, there is an exciting story ahead of you. In 1943, the troops of Nazi Germany had already occupied almost all of Europe, and the battles were fought in the every depths of Russia. The only thing the British and Americans could do was to bomb the industrial areas of Germany in order to destroy military production. But this did not give the desired result. The Germans quickly dispersed production, transforming it from large cities to rural areas, and then generally placed equipment in deep mines and tunnels. At the same time, the English scientist inventor Dr. Barnes Willis found out that it turns out that the entire metallurgical production of Germany depends on water reserves accumulated in the reservoirs. And if the dams are blown up, then the main giant factories will significantly reduce their production. And when the dams are destroyed, there will be a terrible flood. According to estimates, the damage caused by the destruction of only one large dam was comparable to a year of continuous bombing. But for the explosion, it was required 30 tons of explosives. Firstly, at the time there were no planes capable of lifting a 30-ton bomb. Secondly, there were no planes capable of dropping a bomb so accurately that it hit the dam. Thirdly, the Germans protected the dam with special anti-torpedo nets. But the scientists calculated that if the bomb was blown up not on the dam itself, but pressed against the wall at a depth, then only 5 tons of TNT would be needed. And then Wallace remembered how stones jump on the surface of the water if they are thrown hard from a low height. She will be able to bounce off the surface of the water several times and easily jump over all the anti-torpedo nets. And when the bomb hits the edge of the dam protruding above the water, it will stop and sink. And at a given depth, it will explode at the command of the barometric sensor. And this idea turned out to be quite real. With the big bomb, there were also big problems. Firstly, the only Lancaster heavy bomber capable of delivering a bomb to the target had a relatively low speed at low altitude, about 350 km per hour. If a heavy bomb is dropped from this plane, it will never jump. Plus, an ordinary bomb dropped from an airplane would hit the concrete wall of the dam with such force that it would simply split into pieces or explode at the moment of impact. It was necessary to create a bomb that had extraordinary properties. It had to jump well on the water and not deviate in one direction or another. In addition, the bomb had to be very strong and its fuse should not react to hitting the water and the concrete wall of the dam. But Barnes Wallace came up with a completely new bomb and calculated how to stop it at the right point. He made the spinning bomb. Outwardly, Wallace's bouncing bomb resembled a huge tin can. It was suspended in the aircraft on special bearings and spun up to 500 revolutions per minute. So the bomb was heavily slowed down as it was spinning in the opposite direction and the impact on the concrete wall of the dam was no longer very strong. Numerous experiments with rotating models of the bomb showed that it had to be dropped from a Lancaster flying at maximum speed from a height of 18 meters exactly 390 meters before the target. In this case, the bomb practically stopped at the very wall of the dam and sank. The spinning bomb did not somersault in flight. As a result, after being dropped from the plane, the bomb flew in such a way that its axis of rotation remained parallel to the water surface all the time. So the main problem was solved. But we had to hurry, while the reservoirs were full after the spring snowmelt. But then, a new problem appeared. It was necessary to bomb the dams only at night. The fact is that the bomb did not fit into the Lancaster bomb bay. They had to be placed on a special suspension under the fuselage. Because of this, the flight speed of the carrier aircraft dropped sharply. During the day, the planes would not be able to react their intended targets. They would have been beaten down by Luftwaffe interceptor fighters, and for anti-aircraft gunners covering dams, planes going at low altitudes would be excellent targets. 
In order to maintain a height of exactly 18 meters at night, two searchlights were installed on the plane. The one in the forward part of the fuselage, shown straight down. The other, mounted in the tail, is slightly forward. When the plane was flying at an altitude of 18 meters, the navigation saw one light spot on the surface of the water. With his commands, he helped the pilot maintain a true height of 18 meters. Two of the largest Ruhr dams, Moni and Sorpe, and two spare targets, Eder and Enerpi, were selected for strikes. The date of the combat departure was chosen, May 16, 1943. A total of 19 Lancaster bombers participated in the sortie. Colonel Guy Gibson was appointed commander. The squadron had the official nickname Dam Busters. The first crew coped with the task brilliantly. They dropped a bomb after making several jumps, jumped out onto the parapet of the dam, but thanks to its rotation, it rolled back, went under the water and exploded there. But the most powerful dam withstood the concussion and resisted. The Germans woke up and met the second Lancaster with fire from all barrels. The plane caught fire, but the crew managed to drop a bomb shortly before the bomber exploded. This time the bomb jumped over the wall of the dam and fell from the other side, directly on the power plant building. And although the power plant was destroyed by the explosion, the body of the dam itself survived. The third and fourth bombs exploded in the right place, but the dam resisted again. It was the fifth bomb that did its job. The damaged dam could not withstand the last blow. The Moni Dam collapsed. The remaining planes went to bomb the reserve target, the Adair Dam, which was not covered by anti-aircraft guns, but it was located among the hills, and therefore it was very difficult to fly over it at low altitude. The first plane before dropping the bomb made six approaches to the target, and only on the seventh approach the bomb was dropped. Unfortunately, the bomb turned out to be defective. Hitting the water, she immediately exploded, destroying the plane that dropped her. The crew of the second and third aircraft, despite such a danger, continued to carry out the combat mission, and after several fitting approaches, they hit the dam. She could not withstand the impact of two powerful bombs and collapsed. The crews, who were sent to bomb the Sorpa Dam, were much less lucky. From the first group, only one plane reached the target. The remaining Lancaster dropped the bomb very accurately, but it exploded right on the parapet of the dam. The surface part was blown away by the explosion, but the dam stood. The next plane made 10 passes and hit the dam. It cracked, but resisted. Only one hit was needed to complete the operation, but the Germans were saved by the fog. Thus ended this unique air operation of its kind. And what are its results? Fluchlärm, lauten Fluchlärm, and we dachten, oh God, das ist weit weg, ne? Bis plötzlich ein heller Lichtschein äh, zu sehen war und eine große Detonation. The British then lost a total of nine aircraft, causing terrible damage to the Germans. Just to repair the damage, they had to attract 20,000 people removed from other important industries. After that incident, German Minister of Armament Speer himself admitted that he was very afraid of repeated raids. But the Germans were lucky that their most powerful Sorpe Dam withstood the impact of jumping bombs. The British pilots who returned to the airfield became national heroes. 34 were awarded orders, including crosses for outstanding merit and crosses for flying merit, and their commander Gibson became a knight of the highest order of the British Empire, the Victoria Cross. Inventor Barnes Wallace became a member of the Royal Society of London in 1945 and was knighted in 1968. But the story doesn't end there. No sooner had the Germans secured themselves from low-altitude Lancasters and bouncing bomb, then new, so-called seismic bombs developed by the same Dr. Wallace fell on their heads. And if this video gets at least 100 likes, then in the next issue we will tell you how Dr. Wallace and the British pilots managed to destroy the V3 Super Cannon and important underground German structures. Thanks for watching, see you in the next issues.